front here so they can get a picture with you the award. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Oh, that's beautiful. There we go. Oh, yeah. It'll go right next uh, to the award I got uh, from the steel workers honoring uh, Russ Feingold. I mean, not Russ, uh, Paul, Paul Wellstone, uh, who was a, a great friend of mine and tragically died uh, young in his career. He would have been a great president. So um, thank you. Uh, it's an incredible honor. Whenever anybody uh, likens me to Wayne Morris, it's, it's the highest compliment. Uh, that they can pay to me uh, in my service uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, you read the pledge, uh, so I won't, I won't do the pledge again, but I live by that pledge. I have it posted on the wall of my office. Uh, I have a little hero's corner uh, in, uh, in my office, and Wayne is hanging there right next to John Lewis, my recently departed friend, and just uh, with Bobby Kennedy and, and a few others. Uh, it's a small group, uh, but they were people of incredible uh, integrity and inspiration to me uh, in my political career. Uh, Wayne and I have some late night conversations uh, uh, with what's going on in Washington, uh, you know, and because uh, people come in and say, who's that? And I say, is that your uncle, your grandfather? I said, no, no. And I said, that's Senator Wayne Morris. And most people, I have to explain to them who he was and what he did. Uh, we've mentioned a, a few of his accomplishments. Obviously, um, you know, his uh, vote of conscience against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution uh, and the ceding of the uh, congressional obligation of Congress uh, in cases of war and peace. And something that I fought for through my whole career in Congress to restore uh, Congress's rightful place uh, in war powers. Congress did, after the, boating, uh, the, the bombing of Cambodia, adopt the War Powers Resolution, but it was, there were two versions. Uh, and one version would have said, before you start the war, you have to get permission from Congress. The other one said, well, after you start the hostilities, then you have 60 days to come to Congress, and then they can halt them if they wish. Unfortunately, the second prevailed. It doesn't work. Because once the bullets and the bombs start flying, the juices start flowing, uh, you know, it's impossible to stop. Uh, and I think it's really, really uh, symbolic that we're here today, uh, just two days after President Joe Biden ended America's forever war in Afghanistan. You know, I voted for the original resolution after 9-11. Uh, and that resolution was intended uh, to uh, go after Osama bin Laden uh, and uh, al-Qaeda uh, and obviously displace the Taliban who was harboring him, but not to engage in what then uh, became the global war against terrorism of George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld, the unbelievably disastrous invasion of Iraq, the worst foreign policy mistake in the history of the United States of America, even worse than Vietnam. Uh, and it struck on for 20 years. And finally, finally, uh, it has come to an end. Uh, and we are still debating and fighting over repealing that authorization uh, for use of military force, which has been misinterpreted, misused, misused by presidents of both parties. Uh, and it's time it ends. Uh, and I'm hopeful that this Congress will be the Congress that finally uh, repeals that and better yet, adopts my legislation to fix war powers to be sure in the future the Congress is consulted before hostilities begin. And that so we don't send our young men and women uh, to war under false pretenses. Uh, Vietnam, the domino theory, Iraq, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it's tragic. Uh, with lots of lies and treasure and not only that, but the unbelievable instability we've introduced uh, into that region. So I, I think this is a, a great day uh, for the award. A few more things uh, about the senator. Uh, one day I, I got in a taxi in DC. This was probably 15 or 20 years ago, uh, 15 I think. And an elderly African-American cab driver looked, and I had my congressional pin on. I was coming from some event, and he says, you remember Congress? And I said, yeah. 
He said, what state? And I said, Oregon. He said, Oregon. He said, greatest man I ever knew. And I said, who's that? He said, Senator Wayne Morse. And he had worked on the Morse farm up outside of Washington, D.C. as a young man. He was an elevator operator in the Senate. And, uh, and one day, he was coming in on Sunday to go up with Wayne up to the farm and work. And he was late. And he said, oh, Senator, excuse me, Wayne, he was late. And he says, so I'm running down the street, down Constitution Avenue. And he says, suddenly, police car pulls up, siren on, and the police like, what? He said, get in the car. And so they put him in the car. They take him to the police station. They're interrogating him. What are you doing? What, you know, why are you running down the street? You look suspicious. You know, black, young black man. And uh, they, then they go out of the interrogation room and they leave him. And, he, and he's looking around. And there's a phone. So he picks up the phone and he calls the office. And he says, he says where are you? And he says, I don't know. He says, I, I'm in the police station. He says, they were... And he says, and then the cop walks, in, walks back in, he says. And he says, I didn't tell you you could use that phone. And he said, no, sir, no, sir, it's for you. And he hands <laughs> the guy the phone. And on the phone is Senator Wayne Morse. And the guy just goes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, no, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Right away, sir. And he, he said, next thing, he's in the back seat of the police car with the siren going, going on down to the U.S. Senate to meet with Senator Morse. But the story doesn't end there. They had a law, an unconstitutional law in D.C. because they didn't have home rule at that point. They barely have home rule now with the interference of Congress, but it's better than it used to be, called a preventative detention. And they were arresting him for preventative detention because, hey, he looked like he was about to do something. And Wayne Morse changed that law. They did away with that law. I mean, that's a small part of his legacy, but that's the kind of man uh, he was. Uh, so extraordinary and an inspiration to me uh, during the war. Uh, my brother had served uh, twice in Vietnam, and he came back the second time, and he said, this is, you know, this is a huge, huge mistake. Uh, and, um, you know, I was, uh, I was in graduate school here. I saw, I heard the senator speak. Uh, that was during his comeback campaign early in the after he had lost to Bob Packwood, basically over the issue of voting against uh, the Vietnam War. It was a huge and raging controversy in this country uh, at the time. Uh, you know, we had a motivated younger generation protesting the war, uh, you know, and then we had the, those who had committed us to that war and continued, uh, continued the war. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I was just so, so inspired uh, by him. I, I became a draft counselor. So, uh, you know, because we had a draft, which I am still dealing with because I have been trying to abolish the selective service system for 25 years. I actually managed to do it once in a vote in the House. Uh, and I'm probably the only member of Congress that I know of who's had there's a very, very rare procedure when you voted for an amendment and won that someone, when the House rises, can call to revoke that amendment. I passed the amendment to end registration for the draft, which is never going to happen again, but it is an unconscionable burden on young people. Okay, yeah, not a big deal to sign up, but if you don't sign up, by age 26, you have no remedy. You're banned for life from federal employment, federal benefits, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, and I will say that you know there's no good statistics, but I would bet that in predominantly that is impacting uh, people, uh, poor people, and people of color who don't get told uh, in school that wow you've got to register for the draft. You're 18 now. Uh, and uh, I, I I once won the debate, uh, and then the committee rose, and then they brought the bill up again, the vote up again, and. Sonny Montgomery, a former general from uh, uh, Mississippi, got up and gave this impassioned speech. And, um, you know, uh, I lost. Uh, so now uh, we've had a commission. The commission says, well, it's a time of equal uh, rights, men and women, so women should be subject to registration for the draft, too. Uh, that is, to sign up for something that's never going to happen that's meaningless, expensive, 
uh, bureaucratic, burdensome, and also, if they don't sign up, be subject to these potential lifelong penalties. Uh, there will be a vote this week uh, in the uh, Armed Services Committee, uh, which uh, Jackie Spear from California is carrying. We're working together on this to say, no, we're going to put uh, draft registration into deep standby because we're never going to use it. We're going to save tens of millions of dollars a year. We're not going to make everybody register. Uh, and, but if there is a future draft, it says, then both men and women will be subject to it, but Congress would have to authorize it. Uh, I, that vote is very uncertain. The senator, is, uh, the senator has already voted to include uh, women, uh, which is going to double uh, the number of people at risk. So uh, that is uh, one of my many, many uh, ongoing struggles. Uh, it takes a long time to get stuff done in that town. Uh, and, you know, um, I, you know, I've worked diligently and hard at it and stood up to presidents of both parties uh, and, uh, and powerful forces. Uh, you know, just this last uh, December, in, a year, in the year-end omnibus budget bill, but no one knew what was in it, it was so big, I managed to get in uh, something I've been also working on for a quarter century, century take away the antitrust immunity of the health insurance industry. They didn't notice it. Uh, until afterwards, they went berserk. Uh, but it is going to help uh, the American people with lower uh, insurance costs, but there's much more to be done. When Wayne was in Congress, LBJ, great society, uh, dramatic reduction in poverty rates among seniors uh, and children with the programs that are adopted, Medicare, uh, you know, food stamps, uh, all these other things that helped people uh, you know, dramatically. And what we're trying to do now with uh, President Biden, not the, not the hard infrastructure bill is a work in progress. The Senate bill, truthfully, is not good. Uh, and I'm trying to fix it as best I can. It does not do what my bill did, is put us on a path to be not polluting from transportation anymore and put us on a path for 21st century resilient transportation system in this country. Um, and I'm trying, uh, fighting hard to fix that and reconciliation, and, and we'll see how that works out. But, um, but the bigger portion uh, is to continue uh, what we're doing right now, the child tax cut that has lifted more children out of this country, out of poverty in this country than anything else we have ever done. Uh, and, uh, and to then also extend that extend uh, affordable child care. Uh, there's a lot of women uh, you know, who would like to be in the workforce or single parents, men or women, but the, the cost or the availability of child care and such, they can't do it. Uh, so child care. And people say, what's child care in that? We're saying, no, it's human infrastructure. Uh, we're putting the kids in a healthy place. Oh, by the way, we're going to mandate that child care workers get paid 15 bucks an hour minimum. Uh, and, you know, because right now a lot of them are earning minimum wage, which in some states is $7.50 an hour, the federal minimum wage. That's absolutely absurd. We're trusting our, putting our kids in the trust of people who are only earning $7.50 an hour. I mean, I, I'm sure they're well-intentioned people and good, but we're not getting the best we could. Uh, and the turnover rate is very high. Uh, and then there are other crucial elements. Uh, we want to expand Medicare uh, to people at age 60. Uh, we want to uh, finally uh, take on the prescription drug industry. Uh, we are, you know, we're their uh, profit center. Uh, every other nation on earth negotiates lower drug prices for all of its citizens, no matter what system they have, single payer or the German private, you know, system or whatever system they have. But all the countries start out by saying prescription drugs are too expensive. We're going to negotiate lower prices, which get passed through the system. We're the only developed nation that doesn't do that. And we are their profit center. They're price gouging us. And they say, oh, well, we won't do research anymore if, if, you, if you do this. Well, actually, they spend more money on advertising, overhead, executive bonuses, dividends, and stock buybacks than they do on research by far. Uh, that's, that's not true. And you might have just seen ads running recently against me on that, paid for by a dark money group. $100,000 worth of ads saying I'm promoting socialism and taking drugs out of the hands of seniors, uh, me and Nancy Pelosi, of course. So, um, you know, the job isn't done. 
Uh, this reconciliation bill is going to be a, a difficult uh, fight, but it, it will, uh, will be incredible uh, for the United States of America, and all the people of the United States of America, uh, linked to the infrastructure bill and the jobs and, and what that will provide and hopefully the improvements I'll make to get back to the climate change provisions that I had. Uh, so it, it's, it's an honor to receive this today, uh, and uh, my work is still in progress, and Wayne will continue to be an inspiration. So thanks, everybody. I really appreciate the work. So this, that concludes our program, and we're very proud of our congressman.